I wanted to bring today's episode to the podcast talking about fertility charting. We're digging into how to know if you're ovulating, what you could be missing if you're relying solely on OPKs, what your period actually is telling you about your health, what spotting could mean, and more questions about your period. Excited for you to listen and thanks again for being here. Hey there, thanks so much for listening to the Get Pregnant Naturally podcast. And I've got a favor to ask you if you are enjoying learning about the functional approach to fertility, consider going to iTunes and rating and reviewing the podcast. This is how it helps the show reach more people that are struggling with infertility, knowing that there's another approach that really can get to the bottom of why it's not working in the first place. So all you need to do is if you're on the app or the desktop, just go in and consider leaving a five-star rating and leave a review. And there is step-by-step instructions in the show notes showing you exactly how to do that. So if you can just take a few minutes, just take a few minutes right now, you can pause this, this recording, come back, leave the review. It would really mean the world to me and help others that are on the fertility journey as well. Take care. Hey there. I regularly speak with five to 10 couples per week who are struggling to have their baby. And although we want to help everyone, we only have two spots available per month to work with us. So the supercharger fertility discovery call is for action takers and really people who are ready to move forward so they can finally have their baby. And if you're not ready and you wait, the risk is you'll need to wait two to three months for a spot to open up. So if you're seriously considering working with us, go to fabfertile, F-A-B-fertile.com and click on book a free call. Then you'll be all booked in and ready to spend 30 minutes to give you the action plan to getting pregnant naturally. That's fabfertile, F-A-B-fertile.com and click on book a free call. One theme that keeps coming up with the couples in our Fab Fertile Couples Coaching Program is sleep. Whether it's insomnia, having a hard time falling asleep, waking up at night, or feeling tired when we wake up, sleep is critical for fertility and hormones. And that's why I'm so excited to have Blue Blocks as our podcast sponsor. So we're exposed to blue and green light from our phones, our tablets, our computers, indoor lights, and more. And this exposure impacts our melatonin production. And melatonin is essential for both female and male fertility. It helps determine the frequency and duration of our cycle and impacts sperm. There's lots of blue light blocking glasses on the market, but the ones from Blue Blocks, they've actually compared other popular brands and Blue Blocks block 100% of blue and green light while other brands fall short. So I have their sleep glasses. They have red lenses and the ones I have are a little translucent uh, frame and they're so stylish and really cool. And so they eliminate 100% of the blue and green light in the 400 nanometer to 550 nanometer nanometer range. So this is exact range has been shown in clinical studies to disrupt melatonin and negatively impact your sleep. So all you do is wear your sleep glasses after sunset until it's time for bed and you'll notice improved sleep after just one use. And it's also cool to use when you're flying for managing jet lag. So I, I got to say I was a little skeptical about the noticing uh, improvement after one use, but literally I, do, I use these glasses and my sleep is actually already pretty good. I use them for one day and I have to say after one day, I had the best sleep of my life. I just felt so rested. So these glasses, they ship free and they're tracked for all orders anywhere in the world. And also they have all their frames come in prescription, non-prescription and reading glasses. Plus you can send in your frames and they'll add the blue light blocking and green light blocking lenses to your frame. So this is an easy hack that you can add to your fertility toolkit. All you do is go to blueblocks, B-L-U-B-L-O-X.com. Use the coupon code Get pregnant podcast at checkout and receive a 15% discount. That's blue blocks, B-L-U, B-L-O-X.com and use the coupon code get pregnant podcast to receive your 15% discount. Please refer to the disclaimer at the end of the show. We are not doctors. Be sure to consult with your physician before making any of these changes. Our goal is to educate you so you can be empowered to know that there are many changes to help you get pregnant naturally and improve your chances with IVF. I didn't need to go to donor eggs. Obviously, mm-hmm. I don't regret it. I have beautiful children. I could have done things differently, restored. I was still cycling back in my in my 20s. I could have looked at my health, the environmental toxins, the stress I was under. Many, many women are being told their eggs are too old. That's often merely an assumption that's not based on actual evidence. The reason being that there is no direct test of egg quality. You can't test egg quality. It's the man who's got a food sensitivity or he has a zinc deficiency. Like there can be a root cause to these symptoms that are, you know, quote unquote, period problems that the doctor will pass you a pill without any question of why. And some part of you knows 
that if you can reframe your journey from not one of struggle, or if it is struggle, learn how to embrace the struggle. Learn how to embrace it. Most conditions in the child occur during the nine months of development. It's the, the genetic switches are turned on or turned off and they're pre-programmed. So you are in such a powerful, amazing position to do amazing things for your kids. You know, why is IVF the first step? Because we believe it should be the last step. Welcome to Get Pregnant Naturally, where functional medicine and natural fertility solutions will help you get pregnant and have your baby. I'm Sarah Clark, founder of Fab Fertile and your host. I believe the functional approach is the first step for anyone struggling with infertility, and my aim is to help you get pregnant naturally. Today, I'm welcoming Brandy Buscow and Justine Altman back to the podcast, and we're digging into how fertility charting can better help you understand your fertile window and ovulation and what your period is actually telling you about your health. This episode is for you if you're not sure if you're ovulating, you don't know how to find your cervix or what cervical mucus really means. You've used so many OPKs that they now cause you so much stress and you don't even know if you're using them correctly. You don't know if you're missing your fertile window every month and you're not even sure what your, your period is actually telling you about your health. So definitely check out episode number six for a functional medicine one-on-one talk, plus a look at some of the tools we use to help couples conceive. And Brandy and Justine are part of my team here at Fab Fertile. They're an integral part of our couples coaching program which uses functional lab testing, diet, and lifestyle changes to dramatically improve conception. And if you are struggling with infertility, your body is desperately trying to tell you something. And focusing on your health will either help you get pregnant naturally, or if you do need to go to the fertility clinic, it will improve your chances of success. And Brandy is a functional diagnostic nutrition practitioner, certified transformational health coach and EFT practitioner. And Justine is a functional diagnostic nutrition practitioner. She was diagnosed with PCOS and struggled with infertility. And she had her first baby with, with fertility treatments. But after taking a functional approach, she was able to conceive her second child naturally. And thanks so much for listening. I'm so thankful that you're here. Make sure you hit subscribe. And if you know someone else who is on the fertility journey, please share this podcast with them. Hey, guys. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having us. Awesome. Yeah, excited for you guys to be here. So we're going to be digging into fertility charting. And this is something obviously that we deal with a lot. And we field a lot of questions about this. So really wanted to break down the basics today, kind of see where, talk about where we see um, some mistakes, some things where people kind of go wrong and some easy um, fixes for us to help. First of all, we're going to talk, uh, talk about, well, uh, what exactly is fertility charting? And we'll start with Justine. Yeah. So fertility charting is a way for us to sort of read our body's natural signs to sort of know when we're ovulating and when our period is coming. So basically, there's a bunch of, of things that our body does that changes throughout the month. So our temperature changes throughout the month, our cervical fluid changes throughout the month, and then cervical position and firmness and openness also changes throughout the month. And so sort of getting used to being able to read those signs can really give us a, a good picture of when it is we ovulate and when our period is coming and sort of know whether, uh, whether there's some dysfunction, essentially. What happens during our cycle is a really good tool to sort of measure how our body is responding to everything it's supposed to be doing. Yeah, we typically see a lot of questions about the cycle when we're doing the Dutch test. So definitely check out the Dutch test 101. This is part of our, our couples coaching program. So we have access to functional testing. And one of the ones we do the Dutch test, which is the dried urine test. And so Brandy, what's, what are you kind of seeing there with, I guess, with regards to uh, some of the questions about fertility charting kind of as, as in, in regards to the Dutch test, perhaps? Um, I don't know if so much as it relates to the Dutch test, but one of the things that I think that we've found with the clients that we work with is that there are, some of them actually aren't always clear mm -hmm. on the signs that their body's giving them. And I think this is a good educational piece that women really need to understand, especially when they're trying to get pregnant, because the cycle is a barometer for how your body is doing. So if something is off in your cycle, then then that is a big clue that there's something underlying that may be going on and contributing to that. And that could be, you know, the stress in your life. Everybody's experienced where you've had a super stressful month and your period's late or it's a little bit early and it, it just it didn't happen the way you had expected it. So it's a barometer for women. It's actually a benefit to us as opposed to men who don't really have that. That those are, That's a clue that can clue us into something is off or wrong a lot earlier 
than um, say men would get those clues. And so what we have found is that most women just aren't really in touch with those signs and really we're not taught about them. So they don't even know to look for them. And I think that's why this podcast is important because we can explain how charting works and one of the signs and what can you look for when you're looking to see how healthy your cycle is. Yeah, we'll go into the OPKs a little bit later, but that's kind of what we're seeing when we're doing some of our testing and then people are relying on OPKs. And that for me too, like I had irregular cycles. My cycle came twice a year and I... I had no clue that was, I had no clue that that was a huge clue for my fertility and hormones and my health. And I just thought it was a great idea that it was great that my cycle was not coming. And then when it came time for me to get pregnant, obviously that was not such a great thing. So yeah, we wanted this podcast to really be able to dig into that. So as far as the fertile window, I think this is something that, you know, we're taught as little girls and women that are, you know, in our teens that we can get pregnant all month long, but how do we know when our fertile window is? And we'll start with Justine. Yeah. So our fertile window, um, for the most part, the most sort of the biggest sign that our body gives us is that we start to have different cervical mucus. So around when we're fertile, it starts to become watery or egg white consistency. Over the span of a couple of days, it continues to change. But essentially at the beginning of our cycle, you know, it's, um, we have our period for the first handful of days and, and then it's sort of, um, the cervical music is sort of creamy or sticky. And then as we start to move into the fertile period, again, it becomes watery or egg white. And it's even it even becomes stretchy, right? So if you've got a small amount of it between your fingers, you can spread your fingers apart. And a lot of times it'll, stre- it'll spread from finger to finger. And so this is a really good way for us to know that we're in that fertile window. And so it doesn't tell us exactly when ovulation happens, but it tells us that we're in that phase where if we were to have intercourse, that, we, that basically the sperm would be there uh, waiting for ovulation to happen. Um, and we know that sperm can live live in the woman's body up, you know, five or six days up to about six days. Um, And so we have this window of, you know, up to six days where we can conceive. Um, And then after ovulation happens, it sort of goes back to this creamy or sticky consistency. The other thing that happens is the sort of the other biggest sign is the temperature change. So when ovulation happens, our temperature shifts by, it's different from person to person, but maybe maybe half a degree, sometimes even as much as a degree. But the thing is when the temperature changes, that's when ovulation has already happened. And so that's why the cervical fluid is really useful is because it gives us a warning sign a couple days ahead of time. So basically as soon as our fertile window is starting, our cervical mucus changes and we know right away like, okay, now is our fertile window and now is the time for us to start trying. Anything you want to add in there, Brandy? No, I mean, that's a really good uh, explanation. And I think, again, it's important. We do have this misconception of, you know, oh, we're, we're, we're trying all the time, but it's important to know that if you are trying to conceive, there is a window of time for you to do it. Um, to be successful. And like Justine said, it's at that six day window. So, you know, it's a few days before you actually ovulate. And, you know, if the sperm is there, even after you ovulate, there's still a chance, you know, after that time where you can become pregnant, relying just on those ovulation predictor kits or OPKs, like you said, Sarah, that may only give you like a very short window of like a day or two. Whereas if you're really paying attention to your cervical mucus, you should start to be able to see trends every month to know like how wide your window is. And then you can get to know your body and plan accordingly. Yeah. So let's dig into those OPKs. So which can, uh, you know, solely relying on them can really, some cases, lower our chances of conceiving. Anything you want to say there, Brandy, about those? Well, we've asked this question to many of our women where they'll say, well, I'm using the ovulator predictor kits and then I'll ask the question and they'll say, I'm, and I'm not sure if I'm ovulated or if I'm about to ovulate. And I will ask them, well, what is your cervical mucus doing? And they'll be like, well, what do you mean? I, I don't, I've never checked that before. I don't. And, and this is where, you know, it's important for you to get in touch with your body and not rely on a kit or, um, you know, a stick that you either urinate on. I think there's some that are saliva. I'm not entirely sure on that, but um, it's better to listen to the clues of your body, chart your temperature as Justine was saying, because you can again, see the trends and then you are more empowered. You're not relying on something outside of yourself to tell you if you've ovulated or if it's an opportunity for you to have intercourse to to get pregnant. Anything you want want to say on uh, OPKs, Justine? 
Yeah, the same thing. Uh, I, so I agree with Brand what Brandy's saying is that, you know, when you're using the OPKs, it really gives you a very short window to work with. The value of, of paying attention to your cervical fluid is that you have a much larger window to work with to know when you're fertile and to be able to, to try to conceive. But the other thing with OPKs is that they don't work for everyone, right? So they're measuring, just like with a pregnancy test, they're measuring a rise in a certain hormone. And that hormone doesn't necessarily rise the way that it's supposed to in everyone. So it's pretty typical that women that have PCOS, the OPKs mm -hmm. don't always work. I know that was the case uh, for me. So back when I was trying to conceive my first baby, um, I would get positive OPKs for like 17 days in a row. So I don't know exactly what was happening at that time. I certainly wasn't as educated then and I wasn't as healthy then, um, which is why I was, you know, needing the help. But um, it was it was a situation where my, uh, my hormone was always elevated. Um, and I think my body was trying to ovulate. It was trying desperately to ovulate, but I was still back in that phase where I was having these irregular periods, very much like you, Sarah, where, you know, I would have two or three a year, right? So I never knew what was happening. I never knew when ovulation was coming. I never knew when my period was coming. I was completely out of touch with what's, you know, what cervical fluid was, right? So I noticed that fluid was different at different times, but had no clue that that it actually was telling me something. Um, and so in my case, the OPKs didn't work at all. And we know that that happens for a lot of other women with PCOS too, is that because that that hormone is always elevated or in other cases, we've seen where they just never get a positive, um, a positive reading. And it's because when there's imbalance, there's hormone imbalance, the OPK can't pick up on what's going on. So really the cervical fluid and the temperature and, and sort of some of the other like secondary um, signs as well, the cervical position and firmness and openness, those are all much better ways, in my opinion, to, to track what's going on, unless you have a really sort of normal cycle, basically, that it's consistently 28 days and sort of when things are more normal, the OPKs are more reliable, but for some people, they just aren't. And what about if you're getting a, a positive OPK, is it is it possible you've already missed your, your best fertile days? In my opinion, it is, yeah. So sometimes the OPK, it, you know, it's it's it peaks when ovulation is happening, right? And so your best fertile days are like the three days before ovulation. And like Brandy said, it's still possible to conceive after ovulation has happened, but not by much. Um, and, you know, we don't know exactly. The research is sort of like the jury's out a little bit, but to the best of our knowledge, it's it's like a matter of a handful of hours or maybe half a day uh, after ovulation happens that we could still, you know, have intercourse and conceive. So it's really important that um, that the intercourse and, and that the sperm is there before ovulation happens, or at least that's the best option uh, in the few days leading up to. So, you know, three days before ovulation and two days before ovulation and a day before ovulation, those are really the prime time um, to be trying to conceive so that as soon as the egg is released, there's already the sperm there just waiting for it. And is there anything else you wanted to say about ovulation, Brandy, as we see a lot of people not even really knowing that it's that, that if they are ovulating. Yeah, and this is another thing that I think is important for some of the ladies that we work with because they are, you know, some of them are older and getting into the perimenopause years. And so that doesn't mean that you can't get pregnant, but keeping an eye on your cervical mucus and really understanding what it's doing month to month can clue you into some a few things. So for instance, some women will come back and say, you know, I have that like really uh, liquidy kind of like watery egg white type cervical mucus for a week and a half. And is that normal? And that can actually be an indication of progesterone deficiency. And there's too much estrogen, which is causing some mixed signals. So you have a lot of cervical mucus, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you're fertile. So it's just understanding and knowing what, what's true for your body regularly and then noticing those changes. And an OPK test is not going to tell you that. Like Justine said, it's only measuring a hormone, which again, if that hormone isn't signaling correctly or you don't have enough of it, it's not going to pick up on it. So this is why charting your temperatures and your cervical mucus are two of the biggest things that you can do because it's going to clue you in month to month if something is changing. As far as cervical mucus, uh, so all cervical mucus is fertile, but how, how do we how do we observe the, the peak mucus, the non-peak? What, what are we looking for? You guys are talking a little bit about some of the different consistencies, but what are we looking for as far as the cervical mucus or fluid? Like I said before, it's uh, it sort of changes throughout the cycle, right? And so it's sort of this ebb and flow almost. So the first few days of our cycle is, um, you know, sort of day one is the start of our period and that lasts for some number of days, right? Three, four, five, six, seven days. And as soon as that's done, it usually is pretty um, sticky or creamy. That lasts up until we start being fertile. Maybe days like five through eight is sort of sticky and maybe nine through 12-ish is creamy. Um, and this, of course, is based on a 28 day cycles. Not everyone has a 28 day cycle, obviously. Um, 
but so we've got this sticky and creamy and whether it's sticky or creamy, like sometimes I know it, it can be hard to sort of discern which is which. Um, but the important thing is, is that there really is a, a, a noticeable shift when it switches from sticky or creamy to watery or egg white because it's not it's not opaque anymore, right? It's not the whitish color anymore. It's it's much more clear and it's it's it it's, has a lubricated feeling, right? So instead of being sticky, it's really sort of slippery. And that's the time when the when your biggest fertile window is. So a lot of times that's somewhere around like days 12, 13, 14, 15. So depending on when you ovulate. Um, and then sometimes it stays uh, sort of fertile looking, you know, the the stretchy, the egg white, the watery for a day or two after ovulation. And then once that's happened, it goes back to the sticky or creamy all the way up until your, all the way up until your, until your period. Um, so you know that any time that you've got that change where it's slippery or stretchy or watery, that that means that it's a, it's a good time to be attempting to conceive. Yeah, I did a, a blog with Lisa Hendrickson Jack, and she's the host of Fertility Friday. So she's a fertility awareness educator. So there's an episode, there's a blog on uh, Fab Fertile. You can go to FAB Fertile and click on uh, cervical mucus. And we kind of go into detail about that. So um, talking about really getting graphic here, being able to, so she's saying using a, a piece of toilet paper folded flat and wiping from back front to back, making sure you wipe across the perineum. 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 And pay attention to the sensation you feel as you wipe. Does it feel dry, smooth, lubricative, or slippery? Anything you guys wanted to say there? I, yeah, haven't, so- had a, I haven't had a period in like years. So this is like... <laughs> <laughs> like what? Yeah, mine's been gone for years. So I, I, I do think that's a great option. There's, um, I'm a little, I'm, a, so I'm going to be graphic as well. I'm a little, uh, less formal about things, and and I'm sort of a fan of, of really just making sure that you wash your hands real well, and literally just inserting a finger and, and sort of being able to feel what's what's going on. It's also the way that you would check if you're looking at if you're checking for the other sort of secondary signs, the cervical position or firmness or openness. It's the same kind of thing where basically you, there's no way to check except sort of go, going in. But it's a really good option uh, either way. Um, and, and yeah, it's it's really is. It's easier to tell than you think it might be um, because it really does have a, a pretty dramatic shift when it goes from the sticky or creamy to, to watery or egg white. It really is. Like you said, it's lubricative. That's a weird word, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> um, but it's, it's definitely very much feels uh, lubricated. And there's a reason, right? Because that's it's really conducive to, um, to having intercourse and to really sort of helping the sperm easily get to where they're supposed to be going. A lot of couples that we're women that we work with have, have used Clomid. So who have, which one of you ladies would like to talk about Clomid and how that impacts the cervical mucus? I'd be happy to. So it definitely um, can throw things off, right? So any... Um, um, fertility drugs, right? They they sort of take the body's system and sort of override it, right? And so not as much is happening naturally when Clomid is involved. And so it definitely can change the cervical fluid to where um, it's more sticky and creamy basically throughout the cycle. And that doesn't mean that you're not fertile, right? And so as you said earlier, Sarah, like any cervical fluid still supports conception happening, but it's harder to tell the signs then, right? So because it's sort of overriding our, our body's natural systems, it's harder for us to pick up on what our cervical fluid is doing. And let's uh, talk a little bit about temping. Anything you want to say there, Brandy? Yeah, I- I think, um, I mean, I guess before I talk to the, about the temping is just kind of add to what Justine was saying. When I was trying to get pregnant, I just went in there and I was checking. And I think it's it's an advantage for every woman to get to know their body and to get to know throughout their cycle how things change. Um, it, it Again, it's empowering because then you're like, oh, okay, I didn't know that. You're like, oh, okay, this it becomes softer. Okay, now I understand. Oh, this is what the the fluid feels like. And remember that with cervical mucus, the reason that it becomes lubricative or more abundant is because you want that medium for the sperm to easily be able to get to the egg. If that's not there, it's going to be a tougher time for the sperm to get there. So really, really get to know your cervical mucus. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Now, in terms of temping, um, again, Justine kind of alluded to this at the beginning of the podcast, but our temperatures will rise after we ovulate. And that's a production of progesterone rising. So when your progesterone rises and you ovulate, your temperature rises and stays up. And that's in that anticipation of becoming pregnant and sustaining a pregnancy. So if you start charting and what you want to use is a basal body thermometer and you want to check your your temperature first thing in the morning before you get out of bed, you don't want to be moving around too much. And then you just chart for a month or two. And I would definitely do like a couple of months to get to know 
um, how your temperatures are, but you'll notice this slight increase after you ovulate and your temperature will stay elevated until your period comes. And when then your period comes, the temperature drops back down. So you'll start to see this pattern of rising and falling. And again, that's another indication. You know, if you've been charting for a couple of months, you can see, okay, for the past few months, it looks like my temperature rises on day 16. That's probably when I ovulate. So that's another way for you to know when your fertile window is. So how do we find our cervix, Justine? That is a good question. So uh, it's a little more challenging for some people than others, but basically just like Brandy said, so we just sort of have to get familiar with ourselves and essentially sort of reach in and and, and explore a bit. Um, so it's it's there for everyone. You can't possibly um, reach too far. It, it does change throughout the month like we talked about. So the position changes, whether it's sort of high or low um, and the firmness changes. And so it's described as during ovulation that it's softer, like your lips, like the softness of your lips. And um, and when you're on your period or other times of the cycle, that it's harder, like the tip of your nose. Um, and there are some times other, at other times during the cycle too, where they describe it as sort of this intermediate, uh, so not as soft as the lips, not as hard as the nose, more like uh, the chin. Um, for me personally, I have a hard time sort of discerning the difference between what, you know, like my chin feels like versus the tip of my nose. Um, so that one actually is a challenge for me. And that's one of the reasons why I love the temping so much and checking cervical fluid so much is because those are just really like tried and true ways to sort of have a, a pulse on what exactly your cycle is doing. Um, but also the cervical firmness and openness, right? So during your period and during ovulation, the opening on the cervix is actually more open. And so it's more closed up and tight when, when those things are not happening. Um, and so obviously, you know, when you're on your period, there's no doubt about it when you're on your period. Figuring out when you're ovulating is a little more challenging. So um, you can actually feel that the opening on the cervix is a little more wide at that time when you're around ovulation. Um, and so that's a really good way to just sort of know. Um, and as far as position goes, um, sometimes you can tell. So again, it, it takes practice, basically, um, just like how Brandy was saying, to do the temping for um you know, over a number of months, right? Because it's it's really hard to know from just trying it a couple of times. You sort of have to get practiced at it. Um, but cervical position, you can tell too, based on, so for example, how far do you have to insert a finger in order to reach your cervix? And that will change throughout the month. Another way that you can tell sometimes is uh, if there's a certain part of the month where sex is more more or less uncomfortable, basically. And a lot of times that has to do with cervical position, because basically as it moves sort of up or down, you know, in the vagina, that basically it's it's closer to the opening or not. Um, and that can change how uh, the, the comfort of sex, basically. Anything you wanted to add there, Brandy? Yeah, I was just going to add what Justine said. I had a difficult time really figuring out the difference in like the firmness and the, the position I could because like Justine said, like there's only so far, like if you have to stick your finger pretty far, then you know that it's high. But if you don't, then you know that it's low. But a very good clue if that's uncomfortable for you and you just can't figure it out, like Justine said, pay attention to how it feels when you have sex at different points in your cycle because um, that's a clue. There's going to be some times where it's like, oh, it's not painful at all. It's totally fine. It's really comfortable. And other times where it's like, oh, like that's not comfortable. That's a clue that, you know, your your cervix is a little bit lower. Um, so just some other things. Again, it's it's getting to know your body, just getting intimate with it and, and knowing how you are personally and how things change for you. Mm -hmm. And is there anything you wanted to say more about the temperature as far as an optimal time for conception using the BBT? So you I definitely want, oh, <laughs> I was just going to say before the temperature rises is when you're most fertile. Once that temperature rises, you've already ovulated and your progesterone rises. Um, and so like Justine said, we don't know how long you have after you ovulate, but it, I I would say the same thing. It's probably like a 12 hour period of time after you ovulate where you're fertile. And then after that, um, probably not, but Justine, you can add to that also. Yeah. So it's sort of bouncing off that same idea. And this is why we talked about earlier um, that cervical fluid is a really great way to, to be paying attention to whether or not you're in your fertile window. And it's because um, as Brandy was alluding to, basically, once you've seen that temperature change, you know, so you take your, t your temperature in the morning and it's spiked up from what it was yesterday morning, there's a chance that you've sort of already missed your window, right? Because ovulation happened, if it spikes to this morning, ovulation happens sometime between yesterday morning and this morning when you're doing your basal body temperature. And so we don't know exactly what time of day that happened. But it's certainly knowing that it's only roughly half a day or so that you're that you still are in your fertile window after ovulation has happened. Um, you may have already missed it. Temperature charting is super useful. And I have actually personally done it for 
probably 10 years now. It's a really good indicator of, of a whole lot of things. It's really um, uh, can be insightful about your overall health, um, but really to get to know your cycle, right? And to know exactly how long your cycle is and how much of your cycle is, um, is the first half of your cycle before ovulation and how much is the luteal phase, the second half of your cycle ap- after ovulation. So it's really useful to be able to predict your ovulation window, you know, your fertility, your window going forward. But in that, but in that moment when it happens, it's sort of already too late for that month. Um, so it's really useful to basically know like what's coming next month based on the fact that you've already done it for a month or two months or three months that you can start to see the pattern and to know when your ovulation is going to be. Um, I did also want to say if you are doing the, the temperature charting, um, that there is a lot of fluctuation, right? So when you do your basal body temperature, it may fluctuate a half of, of a degree or so within the same part of your cycle. So for example, you might have a reading of like 97.1 one day and then 97.6 and then 97.3 and then 97.1 and then 97.6. But what happens is it sort of fluctuates quite a bit. It dances around. And then all of a sudden you have a day where now it's like 98.2 or something like that, where it's it had been jumping around, but now you start to see it really be higher. And like Brandy said, um, it's an indication when it's higher of, of there being a higher amount of progesterone. And if you think about it, so the word progesterone, it's progestation, right? And so it's the hormone that supports uh, nourishing a baby, basically. And so that hormone, the progesterone stays high in the second the second half of the cycle in order to support the possibility that there's a pregnancy. And that's what keeps the temperature high. And so, like I said, you'll see it sort of bouncing around in the first half of your cycle and then it spikes and then it sort of bounces around that amount, right? So before it was hanging around maybe in the mid 97s and now it's hanging around, say, like the low 98s. Um, and then you'll see it. I've been able to predict my period coming on a specific day before because my temp had been hanging out high in the luteal phase, the second half of my cycle. And then all of a sudden it, it dropped, right? And so when I took my basal body temperature and it dropped that morning, I'm like, oh, today's the day my period comes. So it's really useful to really be able to predict exactly what's going on with your cycle. But again, in order to know exactly when your fertile window is happening so that you can actually have intercourse in order to be able to conceive, the cervical fluid is what really gives you the, the best picture of like your five-day window before you ovulate. And so we work with a lot of people that there's something going on with a thigh thyroid, be it uh, hypothyroidism, subclinical thyroid issues, so not actually the thyroid, but perhaps issues with the liver or the gut or the conversion, and then also Hashimoto's. So, Randy, what can the our cycle tell us about the thyroid? Yeah. So, I mean, again, it's not like a direct, if this is happening, then there's something going mm-hmm. on with your thyroid. But um, this is where you might start to see issues with basal body temperature, because if there is a thyroid issue, you know, your overall, your basal body temperature will be lower than normal and you might not see those spikes as much. You also might see changes in terms of heavier bleeding, longer cycles, irregular cycles, shorter cycles, more spotting. Um, so if you're starting to see things like that for very regular for a while and then all of a sudden things change a lot, that's a clue it, that you need to maybe get something else checked out to make sure that there's something, not something more going on. Um, and Justine alluded to that a little bit about her, you know, tracking her temperature. It can, it can tell you a lot of things. Like I said, the thyroid, um, they use basal body temperature to track thyroid. So there's a lot of different things that that can be useful for. But in terms of the cycle, and thyroid issues, you're going to see changes in terms of irregularity, changes in blood flow, spotting, um, shorter, longer cycles, not ovulating at all. So you might even notice that some months you're not having any sort of changes in cervical mucus that are drastic. Those could be some clues as well. Yeah. And then for me, they didn't, the, the thyroid issue wasn't picked up until years later. So I had heavy periods and irregular periods. So, you know, was my thyroid off in my early twenties, perhaps I, anything you want to say there, Justine? Uh, I did want to add just one thing, which is that, um, so like Brandy said, you know, that can really sort of throw off your temperature. Um, it, we definitely, we see lower temperatures in general when people have thyroid issues. And like Brandy said, there's, there certainly can be times where like, they're like, it seems that ovulation just didn't happen. And so the, the temperature doesn't always sort of behave in this sort of classic, like low, 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 and then high, 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 high. But in a lot of cases, so even when there is a regularity with the temperature and it's sort of lower than it's supposed to be, a lot of times we can still see somewhat of a spike happen. So that, that if you look over the span of a whole month or the span of a whole couple of months um, as you're doing your, your charting, a lot of times you can still see that there was 
some kind of rise, even if it was sort of, you know, not really dramatic, you can see some kind of rise happen uh, that indicates that ovulation has happened. And that's the second half of the cycle. So let's talk about spotting as it relates to implantation, menstrual spotting and ovulation. Brandy, do you want to take that one? Sure. So I mean, I don't have a lot of experience with spotting with menstruation, but I do have experience with implantation and ovulation. And so sometimes what can happen is around ovulation, after you've ovulated, you might see a really light amount of pinkish or even brownish blood. And it's usually not a lot. And it usually doesn't last for very long. Um, And that can sometimes happen. You know, I have found myself that it correlates with a very painful ovulation where I can actually feel (laughs) the egg being released. If you're having some spotting mid cycle, and it's very light, um, you know, just really lightly pink, very light red or brown, and it's very short in duration. Um, that's likely ovulation spotting. Now, implantation spotting, again, I had this with all of my pregnancies. That's when you are kind of waiting for your period to happen. You're getting close to like, oh, my period's coming, but I'm also having these symptoms and you know, I feel crampy, but I'm not really sure. And you start to get a little bit of spotting where you think it's your period but it really isn't. It's very light, again, kind of similar to implantation spotting. It's more pink than it would be brown. And again, it only lasts for a day, maybe two, and then it stops. That is usually a sign of implantation spotting. Um, Because if you don't get full flow after that, then that's when I would, you know, do a pregnancy test and and check into it. Justine, do you want to speak on spotting as it relates to, um, you know, your period and, and what sort of changes you can see there? In general, so the like what I like to tell people the most is that every period, so every every woman is completely different, right, in how things happen, and every period even for the same person can be different from cycle to cycle. And so, if you have spotting at any point in the cycle, or you have irregular bleeding, or you have sometimes you have a long cycle, or sometimes you have a short cycle, um, so it's all clues about what's going on with your body. And in most cases, like things that are wonky, if your if your cycle is off from what it normally is. Um, It usually means that there's some kind of stress going on in the body, right? But in most cases, it's it's not usually related to something um, serious. So obviously, if there are if it's if it's paired with other symptoms, right? If you're having pain or you're having, you know, if there's anything else that's concerning, obviously you should absolutely check with your doctor. But in a lot of cases, every cycle is just so so different. And when it comes to the temperature and it comes to the cervical fluid and position and firmness and openness and spotting and how long you're bleeding is and whether there are clots and what color it is and all of those things is so different from person to person and from cycle to cycle. It's really hard to know exactly what's going on based on what your body is doing during the cycle. Um, And I would say that in general, um, if you have spotting mid-cycle, it doesn't specifically mean anything directly. Or at least in my opinion, it seems like it's really hard to sort of pinpoint what that spotting might mean. And so like Brandy said, right? So there's, um, she described what ovulation spotting typically is like and what implantation spotting typically is like, but it only happens for some people, right? And everyone is different. And so there is no like perfect normal when it comes to that. Um, I know for both of my babies, I did not have spotting with ovulation and I did not have spotting with implantation and I didn't have pain or, you know, cramping of any kind with either. And so, and in Brandy's case, she did have those things going on, right? And so it's really different from person to person. And we both had, you know, healthy pregnancies and we have healthy, happy, healthy kids, right? So, so there is no like perfect. And it's the same thing um, after a pregnancy happens a lot of times, right? So some people have cramping and some people don't. And um, and it makes people really nervous when there's cramping. You know, it's obviously, that's just where your mind goes. We want to make sure that everything is okay. Um, but in general, sort of my, my main advice usually is unless there are other sort of more serious signs that something really odd is going on, that spotting is an indication that there's some kind of stress going on in the body, but it's not something like dire or urgent. It's It's just a matter of like, we need to remove whatever the stress is on the body, right? Whether that's day-to-day, you know, daily grind, emotional stress, or if there are other stress, you know, internal stressors, you know, so if we're eating crummy foods or we're not taking care of ourselves and getting enough sleep, or, you know, we worked 90 hours last week or whatever it might be, but spotting can, it has potential to happen any time of the month. Um, And so as much as possible, it's just a matter of sort of paying attention um, and as much as you can to actually track it, right? And so um, we encourage you to use one of those ovulation trackers where you can track your basal body temperature and you can track your cervical fluid. And on a lot of them, you can track um, the other secondary signs with the cervix as well, position and firmness and openness. 
and then also be tracking, you know, when your period happens and if there's any spotting. And it's really hard to remember from like from day to day or, or a couple of weeks back, right? So you'll be like, okay, well, so I have this spotting and and sometimes you think like, I'm not going to forget that, but come three weeks from now, you're like, oh, when did that happen? And if you didn't write it down, if you didn't note it, um, it's hard to it's hard to look back and sort of um, use that as sort of data to figure out what might have been going on. But if you track it um, and you sort of look at a, at a month at a whole, it really sort of starts to paint a picture about what might have been going on for you in that particular month. And then short luteal phase. Uh, we see this a lot with some of our clients. Uh, Brandy, do you want to talk about that one? Yeah, sure. And this is this goes back to the whole issue with temperature um, and, and charting um, your temperature. This can be a really good way to see if your luteal phase is short. Um, this is definitely something that I experienced coming off of the pill. I was charting my temperature for months and this is what you do. You, you know, you start to see trends and you want to see from when your temperature spikes to when your period arrives and the temperature goes down, how long is that window? And typically for successful pregnancy to happen for you to sustain a pregnancy, it needs to be at least 10 days. I would say 11 to 12 is even better, but it needs to be at least 10. And if that period of time between when you ovulate and that temperature spike happens and when the temperature goes down and you get your period is shorter than that, then there's not a long enough time for you to actually sustain a pregnancy. Generally, when you have a short luteal phase, this is related to not having strong enough progesterone levels to sustain pregnancy or to, to be up. High enough. And so there's a few things that you know you could do that are easy to extend your luteal phase. But if you're noticing that it is short, then that's when you want to start to kind of dig a little bit deeper and find out, okay, why is my luteal phase short? You know, why why maybe do I not have enough progesterone and what can I do to boost those levels? And there's a few different ways that you can do that. One of the easiest things you can do is add in B6. B6 is really important for supporting progesterone. And for some people, just adding in B6 is enough. But for some people, it may not be enough um, because their progesterone levels are just really low. And so there may be other things that you know you need to look at to support it. And that's where testing can come in. And we can really kind of, you know, you can work with your doctor or work with um, a functional practitioner that maybe can help you um, with boosting your progesterone levels. Anything you wanted to add there, Justine? Yeah. So there are, like Brandy said, there's tons of things that we can do, right? So um, in general, you know, this is, we practice functional nutrition, functional medicine. Um, and so we are big fans of sort of um, digging in and finding out what's causing the problem, right? And so we know that the reason if you're having a short luteal phase, right, if the reason you're not getting pregnant is that you're having a short luteal phase, but having a short luteal phase is not the root cause either, right? The short mm -hmm. luteal phase is because you don't have enough progesterone, but what's causing there to not be enough progesterone, right? So it really means like we keep, we have to keep looking further upstream to find out what's really going on that's causing this whole cascade of things to happen. And so like Brandy said, we really like to do functional testing to sort of find out like, is, is it perhaps that you, you know, it could be like in your gut, right? Are we um, not digesting our foods very well, which means we're not absorbing our nutrients from our foods very well, which means we're not getting enough B6 and we're not getting the other B vitamins and we're not um, digesting and absorbing our cholesterol from our food well enough in order to synthesize enough progesterone in our body, right? And so that means in order to find that out, we would need to run a gut test in order to see what's going on there. So it's really sort of this matter of like, it's not just a hormone imbalance. It's not just what your, what your period is doing, what your cycle is doing. It's really about like, how is your whole body reacting, right? How's your whole body handling the stress of its environment, basically? Um, and are, is there dysfunction elsewhere? Because essentially, like, it's, you know, we believe that the, the body is a whole thing, right? Um, and that everything is completely connected. And if there's really an imbalance, really some dysfunction in some part of the body, especially the gut, but other parts as well, that it's going to have a trickle effect to, uh, to, to all parts of the body, but especially the reproductive system. Right. So when our stress is high, our stress hormone cortisol is high, and that robs the body of so many resources, and especially any of the resources that are sort of involved in the rest or digest rather than fight or flight. Right. And so rest and digest, that includes anything that we don't need to keep us, you know, surviving in the moment, which includes our immune system, which it includes digestion, and it of course includes reproduction. Because um, when our body feels, experiences stress, it thinks we're, we're in danger, essentially. And whether or not we can make babies, 
um, doesn't really matter if we don't survive the moment. And so the body takes the resources it needs because it's trying to keep you as safe as it can, given the environmental information it's got to work with. Yeah, that's with the functional approach. We're looking at the physical stressors, stressors as well as the mental emotional stressors. Are really working on body, mind, and spirit, and looking at the whole person, and not just myopically focusing on you know why is the luteal phase short. Sort of looking at everything. And as far as brandy for when we're working with clients in our program, uh, we're making changes to diet, lifestyle. Again, using we have, we have access to functional testing. Uh, what are you seeing typically with uh, changes to the menstrual uh, menstrual cycle d- during during these protocols that we're, that we're doing. Yeah. I mean, I think I've said this in every single <laughs> review yeah. that we've ever done, but your, your cycle is the barometer for how you're doing. And, um, we will have some women who are working with us and we're, we're working on changing the diet. And so just the change of their diet can sometimes affect their cycle. They'll message us and say, Oh, my, my period is a couple days later than normal. I- I'm worried. Like, is that okay? And it's, they just made a really drastic change and they actually took out a lot of inflammatory foods, which is a good thing to do, but their body was reacting to it um, and their cycle was off a little bit. Or, you know, maybe we're working on some gut pathogens and they're in the process of doing that. And again, that is a stressor when you're doing that. And so sometimes your cycle can be affected by that, but it generally bounces back the next month. And so this is why it's really important in the context of your cycles is to not overanalyze things that happen in a particular month, but more so notice trends. Because if you can really pay attention and hone in and see what your body is doing on a regular basis, and then as Justine was saying, keep a note of when out of the ordinary things happen, then you can go back and look at the overall picture and say, "Mm, okay, I was doing this or this particular event happened. And that's probably why my body reacted to it. But if you're also starting to see trends where it's happening all the time, and there's something wacky going on all the time, that's a bigger clue that you need to dig deeper and you need to look into testing and, and lifestyle and get some coaching. But little changes that happen you know, every other month or every couple of months and it's happening once, it could just be a stressor. Like you ate something that your body didn't agree with uh, on a regular basis or you had a really stressful couple of weeks at work, or maybe you got sick and you had a cold and you were just not feeling well for a couple of weeks. I mean, all of these things can impact your cycle a little bit. So that can be normal. We just don't want it happening all of the time. And what about supplement recommendations? So obviously with the functional approach, we're, you know, it's not a supplement for kind of like the, the pharmaceutical thing, a pill for an ill, so that we don't want to then just take a supplement and target it on one thing. But can you talk about the supplements and also uh, bioidenticals, Brandy? Uh, yeah, I'll let Justine also jump in and, and add her thoughts on here. But yeah. I personally, um, and again, I mean, Sarah knows this in all of our sessions, I don't recommend a lot of things that are just going to fix your cycle because it's that's not the problem. <laughs> so just adding in a supplement is not going to fix an issue with your cycle. We have to understand why the issue is happening in the first place and address that. Now, having said that, you know, there are some things that are very supportive in general for most people. So like good quality B vitamins. You can get a lot of those from food if you're digesting well and you're eating a lot of nutrient dense, good quality foods. You can, you can do that. Doesn't necessarily mean you have to take a B vitamin supplement. Magnesium is also really important. Most people are magnesium deficient. So if there was any supplement that I might recommend that most people would be okay with would be magnesium. But again, it's an individual basis and it's really important to look at your individual situation. And then there are some other herbal supplements, but I, again, don't want to just have a general recommendation because each person is individual and each person's situation is individual. And what about bioidenticals? Anything you want to say there, Brandy, before we hand it off to Justine? Um, bioidentical hormones um, are, you know, can be really good in situations where it's needed. There are some women you know, like we were talking about with the short luteal phase where they are just really progesterone deficient and they're doing all of the things correctly and they're working on diet and they're working on their lifestyle and they're sleeping well and they're working on their stress. And for some people, um, bioidentical hormones may have a place, but just jumping to taking hormones without addressing 
any of the underlying reasons why your hormones are low or why your cycle is off is just a band-aid solution. It's not fixing the problem. Right. It wouldn't be our, our first step to do mm-hmm. that. Uh, Justine, what's, what's your thought? Yeah. So uh, the same thought essentially, but so like you guys were saying, the root of the problem is not the low progesterone, right? That's a symptom of the problem. And so we can certainly supplement with progesterone and that does help with some people. But like Brandy said, sometimes there are sort of less less specific options that can really help, like supplementing with B6. There are also other you know, herbal options and, and, and other, uh, other things, you know, so um, chase tree or Vitex and evening primrose oil and things like that. So there are other things that are sort of nutritive to the reproductive system um, and omega threes, right? And so essentially just sort of having good, good health. But in general, you know, any of those supplements, you know, it's going to be nourishing to the reproductive system. But again, we have to find out why is the reproductive system struggling in the first place. Um, and so, like Brandy said, the bioidenticals can help sometimes and they can bring some relief in the short term too if you're experiencing some symptoms of hormone imbalance. Um, taking some bioidentical progesterone can really sort of help you in the short term, just, you know, make you feel more comfortable basically. But ultimately, it's really important that we find out what's really going on that's causing that problem. Otherwise, the bioidentical is not going to get us all the way there, right? It's, it's, it helps bridge the gap a little bit in the short term, but we've got to find out or at least not necessarily find out, but we've got to address stress, right? We have to reduce stress. That's the name of the game. Um, and then there are other doctor prescribed progesterones out there. A lot, most of them are synthetic. Um, and I'm personally not a fan of any of those for a number of reasons. And, and again, it's sort of this idea that it like, um, it just sort of takes charge of the body and it overrides the body's sort of natural rhythm. Um, and we've definitely seen a lot of cases where with that kind of progesterone that people end up with just really sky high levels of progesterone, right? And so in a lot of cases, um, low progesterone is is part of what's going on with infertility. And so we do want to raise progesterone, but we want to raise it as naturally as possible. And we also want to raise it to the right level. And we want to have the right balance between progesterone. Pro- progesterone and estrogen, but we don't want progesterone to be sky high, right? We need we need it to be in sort of that sweet spot. And if it gets too high, then we just have a different set of problems. We have different dysfunction going on. Um, and we see that happening a lot with prescription synthetic progesterone. Um, so we are fans of bioidentical progesterone, but again, only, you know, basically it's something we, we don't turn to right away. We turn to it later on if we need to, if addressing stressors doesn't resolve the problem as quickly as we're looking for, or if someone is really suffering from, from hormone imbalance symptoms um, to the point where we're just trying to, to get some relief to bring some comfort. And as far as some of the trackers we're using, so you can check out my resources page on Fat Fertile. It's also in the show the show notes and there's some discounts on here. So we have the Daisy tracker and the Ava bracelet. We had one of the representative from Ava on the podcast talking about Ava bracelet tracker, but, and there's also uh, Kendara. I don't have a discount for that one, but definitely Daisy and Ava. Anything you guys like to say about the trackers, ones that you like, uh, Justine? Yeah. Um, so I've tried a lot of them. It's, it's, it's sort of funny. The one that I, I don't know if it's, it's cause I'm old or I've been using it for so long, but the one that I keep going back to, uh, is fertility friend is what mm-hmm. it's called. Um, I think the other ones are really fantastic fertility friend for some reason. Like it's just, it's, it's simple and I'm not looking for all the bells and whistles. The other ones are really well done. Fertility friend looks really old school. Like if you look at it, like even the font looks like it's like, you know, from 1987, (laughs) (laughs) but it does a really nice job of actually predicting when ovulation is going to be. If you've had a few cycles of tracking, um, that it actually does prediction and not all, maybe they all do today. Um, at least for some of the other ones, when I tested them in years past, and it's been a couple of years, um, but not all of them actually did the prediction, but they do have other really great options where you can, um, where you can track the secondary symptoms, right? Where you can track your, your cervical fluid, your position, firmness, openness, all of those things. Um, and it really is a nice way to sort of have all of the data right there in one place. And, and they all do a really nice job of sort of showing you in a, a chart view and sort of helping you to predict when your period is coming and when your fertile windows are and your um, some of them will even show you like a percent likelihood of you being able to get pregnant if you were to have intercourse today and things like that. So they're really pretty useful. Um, some of them are, uh, most of them have like a paid version and a free version. And so you can sort of get by on the free version until you discover like it's got some really cool functions that uh, that are involved with the pay version. But I really encourage, you know, everyone basically, so not not even just women who are trying to conceive, but basically every woman to be to be charting their cycle. Um, because like like we've talked about today, it's really this just like fantastic barometer 
about how about our general health, um, about how we're doing, about whether our cycle is is doing what it's supposed to be doing, right? That sort of classic 28 days with an ovulation on day 14, that would be the ideal scenario. And any variation from that means we're sort of less op optimal as far as body function goes. And so it's just really useful for us to pay attention to it and to see if we're trending in the wrong direction. You know, So for example, if you uh, are working too much or you've got some family stress going on or someone is sick um, and there's a lot of stress, you'll see a change in your period, um, in your cycle. And you know, if it happens one month, then not really a big deal, right? But if it starts to persist or it starts to get worse, right? Or your cycles continue to get longer, you know, more and more spaced out, it's really a sign that you've got to do something to take care of yourself differently, um, or that's going to continue to get worse, right? We want to we want to move it back in the direction of being as optimal as possible. Any trackers or any apps that you like, Brandy? Um, yeah, so I I actually use Fertility Friend. I think when I was um, trying to get pregnant with my my twins, my first babies, um, and then I switched to another one. I think just because I switched phones, um, and it's just called My Calendar. And again, it's not doesn't have all the bells and whistles, but because I've been using it for seven years it's got a lot of data in there that it's pretty accurate at this point on predicting when things are going to happen. So I actually get a little alert on my phone saying, Oh, your fertility window is coming in two days or, Oh, your period is coming in, you know, expected to come in two days. So, you know, depending on what you're looking for, there's a lot of different apps out there that can be useful if, if you use them. Um, and, and I think you should, I think tracking your cycle can really help you to see how your body is doing. Now, for the biohackers out there, um, mm-hmm. I have noticed I have an aura ring mm-hmm. and I have noticed that um, with enough data in there, my aura ring is also, it doesn't tell me, but I can see trends in my temperature changes with my aura ring. And it's been pretty consistent that when it rises um, what from normal and my aura ring every day is generally when my cervical mucus changes and I ovulate. And then when it drops on my aura ring, um, that's typically, you know, within a day, my period is coming. So, you know, if we have any biohackers out there that are using that, that's another kind of tool that you can use a little bit for looking at temperature. You know, my heart rate variability changes and my heart rate changes um, a little bit closer to my period as well, which is also kind of interesting. Yeah, and the aura ring is O-U-R-A. So definitely check mm-hmm. that out. And also, also, they even say the AVA bracelet is kind of like the Fitbit for your for your period. So mm-hmm. kind of the biohacker thing there. And just quickly, any um, books that uh, you would recommend on this topic, uh, Justine? I, you know, I'm actually not the right person to answer that question. I have read very few books on this topic. Most of my study has been uh, related to uh, basically to functional medicine and sort of learning what the what the cycle is doing and what the different changes mean. Um, and so there are lo- there's lots of good information out there basically about, you know, at what points in your in your cycle are your hormones doing different things and sort of what's happening, right? So what what is the lining of your uterus doing at different parts of the cycle and what's happening with the growth of the egg during different parts of your cycle? So I'm actually not the best resource on books. Brandy, what about you? My be all end all is Taking Charge of Your Fertility yeah. by Tony Weschler. Um, it was life changing for me in the beginning. I photocopied the charts in her book and I printed them and had them on my bedside table and I was physically charting every single day. Um, and she does make one for teens and I'm probably going to get that for my daughter. Um, it's just, it's really informative and it's information that, you know, when you're reading it, you're thinking to yourself, why isn't this taught in school? Like it really helps you to understand what, how your body works. Um, she also goes into, you know, positions, like the best positions for getting pregnant and different, you know, strategies like that. So that's a really good book for people. Um, I have not read any other ones, um, like Justine, adding on top of the information I got from that book really was from studying, digging deeper into learning more about hormones and, and their effect. But that would be my number one book recommendation. Yeah. And a really good, another good one is uh, Lisa Hendrickson Jack's, her book, The Fifth Vital Sign. So she's a fertility awareness educator and host of Fertility Friday podcast. Definitely check that out. But yeah, thanks ladies for coming on and talking about this topic. I think there's like, there's probably, if you have any more questions, feel free to send them, send them in to us. These are some of our, the top questions that we get and wanted to, excited to, to dig into this and really, you know, seeing what your period is telling you instead of just, um, yeah, really, really, what is your period telling you? And it's a barometer for your overall health as, as Brandy was saying. So thanks again, ladies. Thank you. Glad to be here. Thank you.
as you know, we take a functional approach to fertility and we have access to functional lab testing. This is the foundation of our couples coaching program, looking at food sensitivity testing, hormone testing, stool testing, hair testing, and also we do a blood chemistry review, looking at your blood chem using functional reference ranges, which will flag any issues earlier than the conventional reference ranges. And we're also digging into the foundation. So we can do all of the testing, but the foundational pillars of getting a diet that's right for you. If you've got any issues with your sleep, this is a huge clue. You've got uh, insomnia or sleep disturbances or waking up feeling tired. We work on sleep hygiene for months, movement that's right for you, vigorous exercise, is not recommended, nor is sitting on the couch recommended, looking at movement that's right for you, and then dealing with the mental emotional stress of dealing with infertility by itself. So you can't out supplement the basics. And a lot of times people are, you know, jumping through the zoom screen at me saying, give me the supplements, but the foundational piece of diet, sleep, movement and stress is key. And so our, our fab fertile method, we're addressing those stressors. So the physical stressors, such as a food sensitivity, gut infections, if you've got a parasite, a worm, a bacterial infection, H. pylori or a fungal infection, uh, that's a stressor on your body. Environmental toxins, you know, we're, in a, we're exposed to over 85,000 chemicals in our environment, and those are, are known endocrine disruptors. So looking at your, your cleaning chemicals, your personal care, your plastics, your water, your EMF exposure, environmental toxins are key to address. The mental emotional side of this, if you've had any kind of failed cycles, failed IUI or IVF, really getting honest about the, the stress that that has caused, even going through infertility in itself can impact all aspects of your life, let alone all the other stressors that you're dealing with. And then a structural stress, such as a pinched nerve or any kind of scar tissue that may be dealing with. And what makes our program different is that we include your partner. So it is, even if you're dealing with female factor infertility, there are always things your partner can do to improve his preconception health. So if you're seriously considering taking a functional approach with your fertility journey, I encourage you to go to Fab Fertile, F-A-B Fertile, click on book a free call. And this call is for you and your partner. That's Fab Fertile, F-A-B Fertile, and click on book a free call. Melatonin is important for female fertility. It helps regulate hormones and maintain the body's circadian rhythms. Plus, it helps determine the frequency and duration of the menstrual cycle. Plus, it impacts sperm count and motility. Blue and green light negatively impact our melatonin production. That's why we recommend blue blocks, blue and green light sleep glasses to all our one-to-one -one clients. Simply go to blueblocks, B-L-U-B-L-O-X.com and use the coupon code Get pregnant podcast at checkout to receive your 15% discount. That's blueblocks, B-L-U-B-L-O-X.com and use the coupon code get pregnant podcast. Hey there, I regularly speak with five to 10 couples per week who are struggling to have their baby. And although we want to help everyone, we only have two spots available per month to work with us. So the supercharger fertility discovery call is for action takers really people who are ready to move forward so they can finally have their baby. And if you're not ready and you wait, the risk is you'll need to wait two to three months for a spot to open up. So if you're seriously considering working with us, go to fabfertile, F-A-B-Fertile.com and click on book a free call. Then you'll be all booked in and ready to spend 30 minutes to give you the action plan to getting pregnant naturally. That's fabfertile, F-A-B-Fertile.com and click on book a free call. I'm excited to offer you a special gift. If you are a U.S. resident, text FERTILE, F-E-R-T-I-L-E -E, to 55444. You'll be prompted to enter your email address and you'll receive our fertility yoga download. In this 20 minute intro video, we focus on a calming and peaceful practice to connect back to our heart. These simple yoga poses can help quiet negative thoughts and make you feel more in control. Download it now and get started today. For U.S. residents, text FERTILE, F-E-R-T-I-L-E -E, to 55444. For non-U.S. residents, go to Yoga Freebie, F-R-E-E-B-I-E, -E -E, to access your special gift. That's yogafreebie.com to access the free fertility yoga download. The Get Pregnant Naturally podcast, including show notes and links, provides information with respect to healthy living, nutrition, lab testing, and is intended for informational purposes only. The information provided is not a substitute for medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment, nor is it to be construed as such. 
We cannot guarantee that the information provided on the Get Pregnant Naturally podcast reflects the most up-to-date medical research. Information is provided without representation or warranties of any kind. Please consult a qualified physician for medical advice and always seek the advice of a qualified health care provider with any questions you may have regarding your health and nutrition program.